right, you accursed, happy Easter, Passover, and Ramadan to you. David Hurley here with the political panel, Scott Reed, Jordan Leichnitz, and Corey Tonight. No Twitter handle, Corey Tonight. Yeah, it's been a mad week in politics th this week, so we're going to do something different on the pod today. We're holding our first ever, probably only ever, Curse of Politics draft of Canadian political goats. This is going to be like the drafts they do in the NHL, only we'll each be picking our teams of Canada's pure political athletes. And we're going to try like hell not to make any fucking horrible mistakes, like the Habs taking just Barry Kilkenyami third overall. All right, everybody get it? Here's what's going on. Our pure political athletes... Wait, wait, what do you mean? Everybody get it? You just said like, yeah, of course everybody got it. Yeah? It was kind of rushed, wasn't it? It's like I'm a, not ready. I'm going into it. I'm okay. going into it. So, all right. Here's the criteria. Scott laid this out. Scott's Scott's pissy because this is Scott's idea. Because Scott listens to Bill Simmons and the Ringer, so this is this is why we're doing this. And and so I'm gonna have. He's gonna be. He's gonna be our rules meister throughout. I feel this is gonna be a notorious pod that people will make fun of for many years, and I'm gonna catch a lot of clay off. Hey, excellent. Good. So here are the criteria. Our pure political athletes had to be elected as prime minister, premier, mayor, or party leader. They've got to be from the last 80 years or so, World War II to the present day. Um, one of them has to be a woman. One of them has to be from Quebec at a minimum. Um, and we're going to argue like fuck about them and score them on the basis of four factors. Charisma, strategic smarts, electability, and accomplishments. When the whole damn thing is over, we want to hear from you, Accursed. We'll put our teams out there on the socials. We'll do a Twitter poll so you can vote for your team. Uh, vote for the team you think won. If you think our team suck, we want you to chime in and tweet your own picks. Or just go to Apple Ratings and Review page and post whatever random comments, thoughts, or concerns for our sanity that you might have. All right, everybody ready to do this godforsaken thing? Well, I, I want to protest the, the rules right out, out of the gate. because Yeah, and then I'm going to get in line to quibble uh, also. <laughs> You know, by, by by the criteria you have... Are you guys like, going to go John Crosby on me and say we include I, Quebecers, I, I, we I have want, to go China I, I, and stuff? No, like, no, I, I, I'm going to say it's going to be tough with the women rule that you have because we don't have a lot of, of uh, women to choose from, uh, which, is, your, which is bad. Send your emails bad. directly to Corey. <laughs> we don't want them at the pod. Uh but I'm, I'm Fuck gonna, God I, has binders full of women. I'm going to complain about the same thing from a we, different we, perspective because, of course, we, well, we should expand it out to men that look good in a dress. We could or, can, or, can we at least do that? Or we should expand it out to women who are not premiers, party leaders, or prime ministers. Because I'm going to tell you, I ran the numbers, friends, and women first ministers. Anybody have a guess? How but many? there's all. I said mayors as well. There's no, I know. There's okay, oh, mayors. <laughs> yeah, Okay, so mayors, 18%. Come on down, Diane Tarion. 18% are mayors, and and the answer for women first ministers, 15. Right. Total. Right. So that's the caveat. Before and as on. Kate Graham said, no second chances. That's it. That's it. Right. Great podcast, by the way. Yeah. All right. With those, with those. Sorry for thinking of women. God damn me, right? Well, you're right. thinking of women too much. Maybe is is part of the problem. I don't know. I, I have a similar one, but yeah. Okay. We're going to address sure. our complaints oh. to the Canadian. Well, what else right, are you going to do on my, an Easter all right, Monday? All right, hold on, hold on. We got to get going. I've got my. I'm going to draw lots, and I've got my 2007 Saskatchewan Rough Riders Plaza of Honor glass here that I've got our four names in. I'm going to rummage around and pick at random. I bet you prick yourself. I'm just going to guess. Really? Jordan is number one. Ho! Oh. Scott's number two. Oh, fuck. Shitty spot. Corey is number three, and I am number four. Second best spot. All right, Corey. All right. The odds are stacked against us. We're just going to have to rely on intellect and... Wait. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, this this so, is so interesting because I, I confess that like a like a lifelong New Democrat, my strategy did not comprise coming first. So, <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. So I'm is, running uh, to be prime minister. That's right. So okay. So um. So I'm going to make the obvious pick. I'm going to pick Trudeau Senior. Uh, I am going to choose him on the basis of charisma achievement. And uh, general, I don't give a fuck attitude, uh, which I think is something we can all acknowledge is important. Um, I also select him for his versatility 
Uh, maybe not so much in Quebec in the later years, of course, though that was a known goal. What do you mean by versatility? You mean like that thing he did on the diving board, like where he yeah. did the handstand? Oh, yeah. The triple for Olympic. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Far more flexible in many ways. Uh, hmm. So so he will yeah. be my first pick. My first pick. <laughs> All right. First pick. What do you think about that, you guys? Is that your first? Well, let's just go. Let's see what Scott picks next. Let's see what his choice is. Not, not my first pick. He's, it wasn't. I've debated it. Um, he was my. He would have been my second pick. Um, but my first pick. Does that mean you peer. agree with Jordan's first pick? Uh, I think it's a good, solid choice. Um, I have a slightly different choice. Are we going to? Are we going to second round now? Or are we arguing about her choice? Well, no, th- let, let's, there's no room to argue until somebody else puts something on the table. So All right, you go. Sir. So mine is a mine's a, a, a peer, at least generationally, of uh, Pierre Trudeau's. I'm going with the right honorable Martin Brian Mulrooney. And I'm going with Mulrooney because I think if this is a measure of pure political athlete, this guy had more gain than anybody else we've seen in our in our in our lifetime. So, you know, we don't need to recite his accomplishments in office because you can just call him and uh, put the phone down and he'll take 30 minutes and, and do that for you. Right. And in a really well, I, uh, uh, people said you can never get elected on the GST, but I, uh, I knew it was better for the country. I knew it would provide us with a system. I, I knew this was just this was a oh, setup man. for Scott. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, this, is, this is elaborate, Scott. I like it. Acid rain, GST, free trade, all these things. So listen, he, Scott. Okay. So yeah. All right. There's an argument for it. There's a good argument for it. It might also have been my number one choice. I mean, if you look at first of all legislative accomplishments, let's just take the big two: free trade and GST. I think the test and the measure of those things is that nobody uh, advocates doing anything about them. As unpopular as they were at the time, all subsequent governments have become deeply invested in those policies as- I know some people that want acid rain back. So I think- Yeah. Um, But so big legislative achievements, two big governments. People forget how big the second majority was. Uh, So two big governments, both of them national in scope. Uh, How much do you dock them for the end? Well, a, a, a fair bit, but I think it's more than outweighed by the beginning. And I think we forget how long his beginning was, right? This is a guy whose uh, charisma, you've often made this observation that there's a weird thing in the culture of the modern conservative party, David, um, where they elect staffers and yeah. they have a culture of staffers. I think it started with him and Clark, right? If you think about it, they were like, they were young Tories. They built up a national network. He was working the phones for decades, runs in 76. Imagine how different the world would have been if he'd won that. No NEP, no, uh, you, you know, no, no uh, how would the referendum have gone? Uh, no repatriation of the Constitution. Lots of interesting stuff. And, you know, I do think you have to dock him in the end. But when you think about, like, his ability to uh, build that network, rebuild the party, break through and win for the Conservatives in Quebec. Like, um, you think about him coming back after the 76. He actually is a strange cat in that he held the knife on Clark, but emerged the victor. Usually people get Michael Heseltine and he didn't. So, like, I just think there's a whole bunch of remarkable stuff holding his caucus together as people think. When you look at the guy's pure charisma, and to this day, if you sit at a dinner table with Brian Mulroney, doesn't matter what your uh, going in prejudice was about him. Uh, you can talk about Carl Heinz Schreiber. You can talk about Slick and Gucci and all this. You come away flabbergasted by the guy, charmed to death. You leave without your wristwatch. Like, he's just that fucking good. And I just think uh, when we look at, like, I, I just wanted one pick that was pure, like, pure God-given fucking talent and charm. And I don't think anybody holds a candle to the guy. Corey, what do you think about Mulrooney and... Trudeau. So well, far. I think they're I, I think they're interesting choices because they both come with with some of the same baggage. Like I think you mm-hmm. can point to the accomplishments that that you guys both did, uh, but I think you can also say that national unity was was you know stressed almost to the breaking point in both cases. Uh, so like the the accomplishments uh, are there. And I, I agree with your assessment of you know Mulroney's raw political talent, especially as a you know a retail politician. Uh, you know, keeping a caucus together, et cetera. All, all that stuff is a huge credit to him. But, you know, it, you can't ignore the fact that, you know, in the wake of, of, of both of these leaders, uh, you know, the country was in, in, uh, in disarray in many respects. You know, you saw the Conservative Party split in two. It has, still hasn't recovered on, on the Quebec side, I would argue. 
uh, and you saw the formation of the Reform Party and the and and the Conservative Party from you know one of the largest, uh, perhaps I think it is actually the largest uh, majority in the modern era, uh, reduced to two seats. So you know there's. You know, there's a dark side to both of those choices and, in, in, you know, and the decision, the accomplishment of, of repatriating the Constitution is, you know, one of the unparalleled accomplishments in Canadian political history. But the decision to leave Quebec off uh, out of the Constitution uh, became the architect of, you know, Trudeau also became the architect of many of our national unity problems. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're interesting choices, hard to disagree with in terms of their impact, but uh, both with uh, minuses as well as pluses. Uh, you know, uh, I think Mulroney's second win is the thing that really impresses me because people may forget this now, but they were careening toward defeat with two weeks left to go mm -hmm. in the writ. And, and the bottom fell out and the liberal numbers were surging and they had to completely pivot that thing on a dime. And my understanding has always been that he was pivotal to that, both his core strength about carrying on and his strategic insights about how to turn things around um, we're, we're you know and all of us know how difficult it is to turn something around that's going in that direction at that speed so in 95 that, in, in the Ontario this is going to seem like a strange comparison but I'll remember this our buddy Rick Mahoney um, 95 Rick is the co-chair of the Ontario election campaign Lynn McLeod is the Ontario Liberal leader she's winning in the polls for a long time she's winning in the polls during the campaign we come to the debate and the long weekend in May with two weekends left in the campaign and the ass falls out of the campaign, literally falls apart. Overnight, the polls just reverse. She's like, it's over. And I I've written a chapter. I've written a chapter for a book coming up on Mike Harris. I've written a chapter on the Harris election campaigns. And boy, you ran a shit campaign in 95. Holy Christ, that was bad on was close a, examination. It was so and, don't, was like, and don't blame it on Rick. You were right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I wasn't. And it wasn't Rick's fault either, to be honest. But, we're to <laughs> but I remember us. I remember us going to a bar as we would do around 11 a.m. each day uh, <laughs> for the duration of the day in that last two weeks. As and one always I, does on winning campaigns. But we invoked yeah. the spirit of Mulroney in 88 and said, all right, here's what we have to do. We got to retool the campaign and we need Lynn. God bless her, who I really liked and was a lovely person. Uh, is a lovely person, but it's like, God, okay, we need Lynn to just hold the fort. We need her to carry the campaign for three days, just, you know, kind of like work the road. She does the road, but we retool this campaign, reorient this ship, and get ourselves back on a winning trajectory. Yeah. And so we need her to do for us what Mulroney did for the Conservatives in 88. And <laughs> we're like, ah! and we like ordered another round because it yeah. wasn't possible. And very few politicians have been able to pull that off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was partially accomplished by a, one of the first really negative uh, political advertising campaigns that was sort of jointly run by the business community and by, uh, and by the conservatives attacking Turner's personally, right? And using his uh, troubles in the Liberal Party against him. I remember the great tagline to the conservative ads, he's not trying to save your job. He's trying to save his own job. Would any of our listeners care to know where you end up when you exit west out of Regina along the Trans-Canada Highway and then bear northwest on 32? Well, it's Prelate, Saskatchewan, rural municipality of Happy Land, area code 306, homestead of the Hurley clan. In fact, my dad was the Reeve of Happy Land. Except that when I was six years old, my parents packed us all up and moved to Regina. They wanted to give the Hurley children all the opportunities only a big city could provide. Flash forward 55 years or so, our presenting sponsor TELUS has the strongest track record of bringing connectivity and the opportunities that come with it to Canada's rural and Indigenous communities. They are the leading advocates for our smaller places having access to the digital tools they need to thrive. So what does that mean in practical terms? They work with each community partner to understand the objectives and then invest in infrastructure and technology to best meet their needs. From spurring economic growth to education and access to healthcare, TELUS is deeply committed to creating the digital pathways necessary to serve each community. When TELUS makes a promise, they keep it. I wanna give you a sense of what TELUS has accomplished here through those promises. 
To date, they've co-invested over $475 million with government partners to help close the digital divide for our rural and Indigenous communities. 504 rural communities and 577 Indigenous lands are now enabled with TELUS Advanced Broadband Connectivity, impacting over 360,000 households and local businesses. And over 23,000 kilometres of remote highways are now safer because of mobile coverage that helps drivers tap into emergency services. Hurley Burleyites, TELUS has an enviable track record of bringing the best connectivity experience they can to Canada's rural, remote and Indigenous communities, on time and on budget. To learn more about it, visit telus.com slash rural. Corey, who's your best political athlete of all time remaining on the board? Well, uh, do I have to do best? Because I think the good strategy on this is uh, I should pick one of the women first because uh, they're in, they're in <laughs> short supply. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I'm going to do that for a more well-rounded team. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to throw out Christy Clark as uh, oh, uh, as one shit, of the. Uh, you took my pick, you son of a gun. Yeah. Well, I, I think you know, in terms of provincial politicians, somebody with a lot of charisma, uh, a winning record. Uh, in terms of accomplishments, I, I think you know that you could point to some uh, where you know even ones I disagree with. I, I'm not a big fan of carbon taxes, but. Uh, she did. She did bring one in, uh, and uh, and was successful politically in doing so, which I I would have uh, before that thought would be impossible. So, you know, she de she definitely has some skills. Uh, don't agree with her on all of all the policy things, obviously, but um, uh, it's it's rare to come from the media world and then become a successful politician. And and I think she accomplished that. That's uh, we'll see whether Danielle Smith has uh, the ability to go from talk radio to the the premier's office and on re-election. But it's a, it's a tough thing to do. And one of the reasons is you're on the air talking about a lot of different subjects. And that's a lot of opportunities to say something stupid or say something in, in hindsight it is uh, incorrect. So to to be able to have uh, been in the public eye for that period of time and be successful is uh, is is a rare uh, political breed. So uh, I'm I'm going to put her on my team. Yeah, and un undefeated, as we like to say on this pod, Christy Clark, undefeated. Yeah. Um, all right. So it's my choice. Yeah, I'm still hurting over that. She was my. I was hoping that others wouldn't pick her. She was. You're right. You out strategized me in my own game. So should have should have taken Christy first. Okay, my my pick. I'm being strategic as well. My pick is Robert Barassa, the two-time Premier of Quebec for a total of almost uh, 16 years. He governed the province of Quebec from 1970 to 76 and 1985 to 95. On the charisma department, he scores zero. Um, nobody, uh, he didn't have charisma. In fact, he was not really ever popular. Nobody ever really liked him. In fact, he lost his own riding while winning a huge majority government. Um, yet, he won a number of huge majority governments. And uh, lost to the PQ, but came back and vanquished the PQ. Uh, was at the center of and delicately managed uh, constitutional talks through both the Trudeau and Mulroney years. Um, did the James Bay electrification uh, project in Quebec. Um, was a very solid steward of the economy there. Um, so Robert Barassa, a hugely skilled politician um, and uh, probably underappreciated outside of his own province, but he's on my team because uh, he's good, knows how to govern, and knows how to win. All right. Hmm. Yeah, I was struck right. by the lack one. of charisma. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Just, it's, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, yeah, it's hard to disagree with the argument you're making. Uh, but, you know, not like, you know, how much of that is, is uh, you know, transparent in this record i guess you know you got to look at the electoral outcome you know it's uh i didn't know him personally i sort of saw through the media was, uh i think i attended a couple of events he spoke at but certainly not a overwhelming public speaker or or somebody who lit the world on fire that way but you can't argue with the the the, the win-loss record All right go away for nine years and come back and uh and Get the leadership of your party back again and wipe out uh, the PQ with a massive majority government. It's impressive. 
impressive as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so my second pick, because yeah. I get two, I get two back yeah, to back. Yeah, you go back to back. You do. Mm. I, <clears throat> I know what you're gonna do. You're gonna crush me right here. I know it. Really? Yeah, I'm not gonna say it in case you don't pick it, but I know you're gonna fuck me right now. Watch. Can I? Can I choose two people? Oh no! No. <laughs> well, the re- the reason I ask, the reason I ask is because. If you could put Diefenbaker and Pearson together, these two but titans, you can't. <laughs> these two titans that fought each other, Diefenbaker, all charisma, mm. unbeatable on the hustings, had no, no idea what to choose. do in government. Lester Pearson, genius prime minister, the worst candidate you could ever find, right? So they would have been great together, but I can't take them together. No, no, I, mean, no I don't pick. think so. But but yeah. Yeah, well, I, I sat there you... last night, like like agonizing over which of the two I was going to put on my list. So you also must agonize. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to take deep. <laughs> I'm not. Oh, taking... See, I was I, fl- yeah. I I swung the other way. Like I, it was it was close, but of course you did because you're cerebral and 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 policy rooted. All right, who are you picking, Dave? Dave does. <laughs> I'm picking Louis Saint Laurent. Louis Saint Laurent and Robert Barassa. Mm-hmm. Fucking dry cupboard in your house. Wow, <laughs> that is strange, man. Those guys are both like chalk. Louis Saint Laurent, my kind of prime minister, a centrist, a moderate, good economics, good focus on economics, strong economic ministers, uh, built the Canadian economy, built the post-war economy in Canada, massive immigration um, policies at the time. Um and uh, a comforting uh, figure for Canadians um, and governed for 10 solid years until the jig ran up on the Liberals after like 35 years in office or something and Diefenbaker, uh, Diefenbaker swept him up. But yeah, that's my second pick, Louis Saint Laurent. You're a strange person. <laughs> well, what's wrong? I have no idea. I've known what's you for 30 with? years. I've known you for more than 35 years. We've been friends and and... And I would not have, these are, I thought you were always attracted to the beating heart, rushing blood politician, the the stump, the person that lit you up like a lamp. And and then you're picking Excuse dry me. technocratic. Excuse prime me, I worked for Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Ross, that's the deal. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so. Based on that, I I think it's Corey's turn for his second pick. Well, I uh, I'll probably surprise no one by saying I'll pick Brad Wall as uh, uh, my next pick. Uh, I think very consequential in terms of the most uh, blessed province in in our confederation, Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, ended what had been a, a multi generational dynasty with a with a, a you know a grand divine blip in the middle. Uh, and, uh, you know, although the party had been unified as the Saskatchewan party prior to him taking charge, it didn't really um, uh, start firing on all cylinders till he got there. And it's, it's transformed the politics of the province in a, in a way that exists still today under Scott Moe. Uh, but really, that foundation was laid by, by Wall. I think one of the, in terms of just pure charisma and uh, ability to deliver an incredibly inspiring stump speech, um, I, I think he he holds you know one of the one of the you know, best records in Canadian politics uh, for the period that we're talking about. So uh, to my uh, no friend French, Brad, yeah, no no, no French. French, but but uh, uh, in Saskatchewan, not uh, not necessarily a requirement. <laughs> uh, if you were to pick a second language, it'd be Cree. But uh, you know, if you're wanting to run there, um, but uh, no, Brad, I think is is uh, just an incredible political talent. Uh, remains so t- uh, to this day. Two Saskatchewan. Uh, listen, first of all, I agree guys. with that. By the way, that I, I agree that he's a huge political talent, and he is the biggest political talent in Saskatchewan since Tommy Douglas, obviously. Um, and uh, you know, took a party that was brand new and had some real barnacles on it that prevented it from being becoming the mainstream party and he turned it into the absolute mainstream party and the NDP have never recovered from Brad Wall. That is, uh, that's for sure. Um, so we got, we got two people from Saskatchewan on this four person panel and, and, and Brad Wall is off the board before Tommy Douglas and, 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 and <laughs> Chief. that's, that's shocking. Well, well you, I thought remember- you guys would go for sizzle, man. 
Well, uh, you know, Deef lost nine elections before he won his first one. So it's hard to, to not look at his uh, early political record and say he was some campaign genius. You now, I like I like I like Deef and Baker. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, but not not a great governing record and not a great political record in terms of uh, his electoral history. I'm sad to say, but. Yeah, uh, maybe get my... You're not going to get it all in any one person here, though. One candidate. Yeah. He was so. D- Diefenbaker was such a good campaigner, or Pearson was such a bad campaigner, that after Diefenbaker had demonstrated conclusively that he could not govern at all, he still he still beat Pearson once and almost beat him a second, uh, almost beat him a second time. So, well, he uh, he's Baker was a legend in my household. Like my well, my my parents adored. Especially my dad just absolutely worshipped in my dad's family, all conservatives, hardcore conservatives, and they adored. Deef was their epitome. They didn't really care about was he talented at governing. They were blown away. They liked to listen to him on the radio, on the stump. That was it. Deef and Baker was the epitome for them. Well, he lacked with something that 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 Brad had. Uh, so just to bring it back to my previous choice, and that is leaving when you're on top. And uh, and knowing how to to uh, yeah. leave politics yeah. gracefully, <laughs> we, uh, we didn't. Stephen Baker really was, didn't have that down. No, no, no. no. It, was, it was it was the least was not a clean end. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the, yeah. the least really graceful exit. Way out. Yeah, no, it was it, it was sad to see. And as it turns out, he was a stick man. And a notorious stick man, right? So now we know that he did father that kid. You know, it's been proven that dude, it looks just like him, is in fact his son. And then like, I had a friend from up like in Renfrew who tells a story of like back in the 60s and Deefen Baker comes and he's staying in this old hotel overnight. And then like, oh, you know, you got to lock up your women around Deefen Baker. He'll like grab a bottle of whiskey and then he chases all the secretaries. And I'm like, what? This is true. And he's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All this well, that shit, would right? have to that would have to prove Henry Kissinger's aphorism that power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Because no kidding. John no Diefenbaker, Jesus! If I've seen a worse looking person, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I mean, but also <laughs> Renfrew, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what do you consider Brad's big accomplishment substantively, uh, as opposed to electorally, Corey? Substantively, like you know, in terms of a policy, I I I, I think. You know, it's hard to point to a to a to a single thing uh, that uh, that you could point to. I, I think it's more attitudinal. I think he changed the uh, the way a lot of people in Saskatchewan viewed themselves and viewed the province, and uh, gave them you know confidence to uh, to go out and and that they could be successful. Like I think he changed the the overall attitude. He reversed the immigration trend. Uh, you know, we we had generations of people, ourselves included, uh, David, sure. who left the province, uh, and uh, and he reversed that flow, and 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 it really is a different place today than it was uh, when we were growing up in terms of uh, opportunity for people to stay in the province and and see a future for themselves there. Is it is it in is it a historical for me? Like when I think of Brad Wall, I think about Saskatchewan's rise as an energy power. Is that is that unfair and untrue, and that that was equally true, if not uh, more true, under previous well, premiers? Course, but course, like, course. I, I equate him with the Albertaization of Saskatchewan, but not just in political terms, but in terms of you know, I think it, that's when I start to think of Saskatchewan as energy first. That's that's well, he made that changes around. Shifted. He made changes around the royalty regime and other things that certainly helped. Uh, uh, reinvigorate the industry, but a lot of that is also global markets. In fairness, and uh, you know, it just. Uh, but I think he took took uh, full advantage of the opportunities that those markets created. Uh, I think he saw things go very well in the mining sector too. Uh, I'll, I'll still uh, uh, tease him about uh, uh, not uh, in approving the BHP Billiton PCS takeover because free enterprise, was, man. Free uh, enterprise. Yeah, that was. Uh, uh, a little bit more NDP ish than uh, than SAS party ish in in terms of no, but that's what made him good, Corey. That's what that's what made that's what made him good. Yeah. He mm-hmm. he had he a feeling for the province. Right. He was savvy, and so like you know he he knew what the mood was on that. He had a really great instinct for when to break with Harper, when Harper was becoming too much of an asshole for even Saskatchewanians. And I remember these two Nigerian girls that, that were holed up in a church. Because uh, they were about to be deported because they'd had a part-time job while they were trying to go to school, yeah. and and it was a big thing in Saskatchewan. These 
these girls were going to be deported and they'd sought sanctuary in a, in a house of worship. And, uh, and, and Wall just cut Harper loose on that. Knew better than to associate himself with that. All right, Scott, what's your second pick? Okay, so Corey took Christy on me. She was my top pick. Um, so I'm going to go for for the female uh, uh, subcategory. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take Hazel McCallion, and I'm uh, I'm going against type here because I do not fuck off. Come I, on, is that yeah, why yeah. you included Mayor? Is that why you included Mayor in the categories? I, I don't, Poor David is so easily upset. I mean, he's got <laughs> Saint Laurent and Butterass. I would expect him to be more composed and cerebral in his responses, um, more technocratic. Um, you know, Robert Butterass never permitted his emotions to get the better of him, Dave. Um, uh, well, I'm not one who worships at the Church of Hazel McCallion. It became a cult here for the last 15 years, right? Oh, really Hazel's going to Hazel's gonna endorse this counselor. Oh, Hazel like, went it to somebody's donut shop. It became impossible to say out loud what a shitty fucking mayor she was. Well, my here are my reasons. And against, even though I was as agitated as you were, David, by all that, it kind of got a little barfy, I thought. Um, one, I don't think you can quarrel with longevity. From 1970 on, she was never not elected, either on council or as mayor. From like when her 35 years, 36, something like that, as mayor, Mississauga became a thing under her. You have to acknowledge that. It became a destination for certain kinds of uh, uh, business and industry. Um, it uh, She created this political persona, which, you know, maybe not my cup of tea, but became undeniably powerful. Like we say, we joke about it and maybe it got under our skin, but like when she endorsed Trudeau in 2015, it was a fucking deal. People are like, All right. when she endorsed, when she endorsed Kathleen, it was a deal. And she would crisscross party lines and endorse different people. And it'd be like, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, you got the, you know, you won the primary of Hazel. Um, so she became very powerful, uh, from an electoral standpoint, she had this massive brand and she was forever on the scene. And I think, you know, before Hazel McCallion, Mississauga was, you know, uh, basically like three gas stations across the street from one another. And now, like, it's a deal. So she's my she's 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 my submission. That's what happens when you don't have any zoning bylaws at all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I left Rita Johnson for you, David. I know you like the charismatic kinds. It's a terrible fucking pick. <laughs> Jordan, tell me, agree with me that that's a terrible pick. Yeah, I mean, she wouldn't be my pick. I, like, I, look, longevity, yes, there's no question. But I think, uh, I think we got to also speak to kind of quality of governance and some, some sort of, you know, bar of, of ethical, uh, Transparency. She made it a welcoming sure. place for developers. I'm not sure <laughs> Hazel <Or> meets. <laughs> but yeah, she was there a very long time. There's no question that there was. She had an absolute stranglehold. Uh, you know, on on. Mrs. Promise Saga. to pave it, and you shall have it. It's bullshit yeah. to pick a mayor. It's fucking bullshit to pick a mayor. Th longevity, 35 years. You're saying she'd have been prime minister for 35 years if she'd wanted to be prime minister instead of mayor of Mississauga? Like, how do you rank her skills against the you other people we're talking about? Listen, listen, Louis. F you know, submit... <laughs> Submit an official objection with the grievance committee. You read the rules. I'm just playing by them. And I'm saying you made a bad pick. Your team is already out of the playoffs. Like, well, no then chance. you're not being you're not being objective. <laughs> yeah, she's a political powerhouse. Well, we're there. I know it's been a long, cold slog, and lots of you are still looking out the front window at snow. And there was a huge, nasty ice storm last week. But really, winter is done. The corner is turned. Laissez le bon temps rouler. Try to pronounce that the way they do in New Orleans or in Prelate. See what I just did there? Magical thinking. We all start chirping optimistically in early March as though saying winter is over will make it happen. I hope it is, but I have no idea. It just makes me feel good to say so. Our sponsor, CN, cannot afford that sort of self-indulgence. It runs a railroad through the reality of Canada's climate. Snow, ice, and deep cold is the enemy of air brakes and steel wheels on steel tracks. And this past winter was typically harsh. The figures are a matter of public record. Across northern Ontario and the prairies, there were about four weeks of 25 below zero cold this past winter. 
25 below is the tipping point. When it gets that cold, government regulations stipulate the trains must be shortened. The railway has to change gaskets and hoses and constantly monitor wheels and track for cracks. Hauling cargo becomes a much bigger job. But here's the point. CN did all that and still managed to set 12 weekly records for moving grain. Last October was its best single month ever. Period. Paragraph. The following five months were right up there too. CN Railroaders broke the record for the most grain shipped in a single week and then a few weeks later broke the new record. To be clear, CN did not break those records because it was a mild winter. It broke them in spite of a mean winter. I've noted here before that CN can't unscramble overseas supply chains, but it can and does ensure smooth, safe, rock-solid dependability here at home. And really, folks, I do think winter's over. I mean, it just has to be. Jordan. All right. I'm going to pick uh, I'm going to pick another mayor uh, and I, I think I'm going to violate an unwritten rule by picking somebody who's sitting in office. I'm picking Valerie Plant and I'm picking her because she ha- uh, she's scrappy. She ran two very disciplined campaigns. She has charisma. She has come from behind. She grew her margin over Denis Coderre and apart from all of her other accomplishments uh, in campaigning, just like beating Denis Coderre is like delicious and doing it twice is twice as tasty. Um, She ran both her campaigns on platforms that were authentic to her and to the vote coalition that she built. She's turned Project Montreal into a force in the city and it's not a blip. So Valerie Plante is my second pick. What are her strengths? What is, I don't know much about her. What does she got going for? So Other than that she's think, not Denny Coderre. That's a yeah, strong well, thing to have to I mean, agree not being Denny Coderre is great, but I think that the way the strength that I would see for her is that she's both, uh, and, and this is a rarity on the left, she's both a visionary and pragmatic. And I think that that has served her very well. Um, she's had an ability. Does to, that mean that she will at some point take a job with a coal man, with a coal mining company? I have absolutely no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I think it's a, you know, we, we, you would see perhaps a different uh, path for Valerie <laughs> there uh, in her post-politics life. But no, she's a, look, she's a great campaigner and she did it in her own way. And I think that that's also, I always admire politicians who have successful campaigns and particularly women politicians who campaign in their own style uh, and do so successfully and do so successfully twice uh, is no small accomplishment. So I think she'd be a, I think she's a strong pick, strong all rounder, fully bilingual also. And uh, frankly, anybody who can hold progressives together in Montreal has got some real, <laughs> has got some real chops. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. All right. You get a back to back. I do. Okay. And I have to say this one is really tough because I think that, oh, are we doing one round after this? This is it. Do, this is your final this pick, is it? right? This is, it, this is your final pick. This is my final pick. This is really hard. Okay, I'm gonna tip what my 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 what I'm torn between. So, and th- these are very very different politicians, uh, and I have three. So I am I am very torn between Tommy Douglas for all the obvious reasons. Uh, very strong, very strong campaigner, hugely charismatic, accomplishments, all of it. Uh, Gary Dewar, he would be the pragmatic choice, I think. Uh, hard to argue, all rounder, and a Tory dynasty, rebuilt the party, ran successive, extraordinarily successful governments that then outlasted him. Like possible coal company, possible coal company, coal company stuff. Man, I love working. I love working with him when he was streaming. He was a good yeah, guy to work with at Auto. <laughs> okay, and then my last one that I'm torn between is, uh, is Rene Levesque. I think, obviously, can't you know. Wow, like it beloved. If you can kill a guy, heroic. if you can kill a guy, <laughs> fuck while you, Jordan. Drunk that was driving, my choice. The while drunk choice. driving yes, with your secretary yes, you and nobody me. bats an eye, you're in good shape politically. I mean, this is my feeling. Bribes over yeah. a guy. And then, you <laughs> know what he got? He got a twenty five dollar fine for not wearing his glasses. Yeah. That's what happened. They did not so, give him a breathalyzer, yeah. and they gave him a twenty five dollar fine for not wearing his glasses. Totally. And so I'm that, that, that is my that is. You my know who did punish there. him? His wife. His wife, his wife well, put a stricter well, punishment down. 
Yeah, it was, yeah. It was out of the out of the picture. So who do you picture. pick of the three? So I mean, Come this on, is hard because these are these are three very different. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do a kindness to Scott. So you can have you can have Renee, the good, the bad, all of it. Um, and I I think I'm gonna lead with my heart, unsurprisingly, and I'm gonna go with Tommy. So I think as an all rounder, it is tough to beat. Somebody uh, who has his level of accomplishment, his level of just charismatic, like, ability, speech delivery, caucus management. Holy hell. Like, through some of the hardest things, uh, even when he wasn't leader, right? His ability to work with others, to see the bigger picture. You know, I think about the debates that happened in his time, you know, and I mean, I, this is like slightly pre-World War II, during World War II, so I may be violating the rules a little bit. But those debates, like you have to imagine the intensity uh, within caucus when you have your leader who is a, a dedicated pacifist, you know, and like, and he, he, uh, he went through that and he was able to hold folks together. And, and then, of course... The impact you can't you can't argue right Medicare Social Security it goes on and on and and he stood up uh, and he did these things even though he was barraged by a kind of negative attack that came not just from his political opponents but from the business community that we can only really imagine today like the amount of uh, vitriol that was directed his way when he was making these changes was enormous. So I think that uh, for all of those things, versatility, provincial, federal, like church basement, he did it all. And uh, versatility, impact, and charisma, he would be my pick. Corey, what do you think about that? It's hard to argue with that. Like, I, you know, it's certainly the most consequential NDP politician in Canadian history, uh, I would argue. Uh, and, um, uh, well, there, there are others that are, you know, more recent, uh, it's maybe a, maybe a half violation in terms of the time frame uh, here. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like a, a more successful Preston Manning in some respects, but I think there's a crossover between, uh, what they both accomplished. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities there. I kind of view them as, as two, uh, two folks with some differences in terms of ideology, but a lot of similarities in other ways and uh, a lot of the same uh, pluses and minuses. Douglas won five consecutive majority governments. Yeah. And, and Davy Stewart told me that after he won an election, he would declare the date of the next one. Like he never called a snap election. He never mm -hmm. manipulated circumstances. Davy would say he'd give us four years to get ready and then he would beat the shit out of us. Right. <laughs> yeah. yep. I think that point you make, uh, it kind of gets overlooked and forgotten, um, Jordan, about you know, the ferocity that he faced. Uh, yeah. Like the, the lobby opposed to public insurance around health, like was just insane. Right. Doctors are moving out of the province. Actually, gonna, it wasn't and, him. It wasn't him. He left. He brought Medicare in, and then he fucked off to lead the federal NDP, That's, and he yeah. left his yeah, he was hapless federal then. he left yeah. his hapless successor <laughs> uh, to uh, take the beating from the doctors and uh, lose the subsequent uh, election to Ross Thatcher and the Liberals. So he left he undefeated and un relatively he was, he was targeted. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, but you got to knock him some demerit points for a like Brad, no French. So as a national player. Not that much. And and really couldn't translate it federally. Lost federally a couple of times, I think. Lost in Saskatchewan federally. Yes, he, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Um, and so, you know, it, was, it, and it what, lost what worked so well provincially didn't really translate federally And I would also well. make the strong argument that federally, you know, his impact was perhaps less electoral, but... But in, you know, his, his influence on governments was massive, right? And, and I think that that can't be overlooked in terms of I, his... I think he was a faded, a faded and diminished version of, uh, of himself by the time he came to Ottawa anyway. Like his, the best years, I think, of him politically were behind him at that point. But uh, he just never had the same dominance or, or uh, in my view, uh, you know, uh, ability, demonstrated ability at the federal level. But, you know... So be it. If you can't, as said, five consecutive uh, elections in Saskatchewan, that's, that's you know, a, enough it's reason in and of itself. <laughs> Especially given that it's in the blessed province of uh, Saskatchewan. 
But you know, it's, I got a great Davey Stewart. I got a great uh, Tommy Douglas story for you. My friend and mentor, Davey Stewart, who, along with Ross Thatcher, rebuilt the Liberal Party to def- with the explicit purpose of defeating Tommy Douglas. And Davey was the party president, and then when they won office, he became the finance minister. Um, and then Trudeau appointed Stewart to the Senate. And then many years later, Tommy Douglas dies. And they are doing tributes to him in the Senate. And by this point, of course, he's become Canada's greatest Canadian. He's not a normal political figure anymore. So all these people are standing up in the Senate, liberals, conservatives, all these people are standing up and just effusively praising Tommy Douglas. And one person says, Tommy Douglas never had an enemy in the world. And Davy Stewart stands up in the Senate and says, point of, point of privilege, Mr. Speaker, I was his enemy. <laughs> he was awesome. Well, good for him. I think, we, I think we lose the color in the deification sometimes. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. Um, there, it's interesting, though, because I, I, I agree, then I acknowledge your point, Corey, that, you know, he was getting longer in the tooth and all that. But there's something interesting, you know, when you sort of take both he and Deef, something about, and maybe I'm overanalyzing, but I, at least on... Uh, superficially something about prairie populism whether it came from the right with d or from the left with tommy douglas didn't seem to translate at the national level and it, it didn't translate into national seats it didn't you know and, and i i wonder i i just i i wonder why i wonder what the i mean i guess it's quebec well, you know ultimately um you know it was such it, a, it's, a stone it's, block but it, it was it's interesting. more than that it's more i think it's more than that there's you know there's a um an undercurrent of of being left out of of national institutions uh, or uh, sort of uh, you know portions of, of of the corporate world and you know whether it's banks or railways like the the sort of long uh, long simmering uh, discontent that you would find in on the prairies around those kinds of issues and that just doesn't really translate well in, into Ontario in Ontario too but, family know, compact so, sort of culture of politics yeah, never. So there's a, a difference there. And, you know, like when we've seen populism successfully executed in, you know, in Ontario, and I would say elements of that in Mike Harris, elements of that clearly with, with Doug Ford, uh, it looks a little bit different than, than what the, the prairie version of that is, you know, whether it's, whether it's Klein, whether it's Manning, whether it's uh, Tommy Douglas, Stephen Baker, you know, there, there, there's uh, that sort of difference of, of feeling like you're a bit on the outside of, yeah. of, uh, of uh, central Canadian politics and relevancy that aggrieved element isn't there in ontario populace like they own yeah it isn't it isn't like we're getting fucked over um yeah it's more of a lunch bucket populism yeah i think so you know there's more of a blue collar element to it than and less of a you know uh, uh the west wants in sort of element well hurley burleyites this confession may surprise you coming from a professional pollster but i hated math in school it's not that I wasn't good at it. In fact, I had a natural aptitude for numbers. It's just that math didn't interest me. Could never see why I'd need it. Well, now I do. Because finding a solution to climate change is, at its core, a math problem. Look at it this way. We need to get our carbon dioxide emissions down as close to zero as possible, fast, while subtracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's the net zero equation. And it's a tough one. In fact, the math gets even harder when we consider how we're going to power all those electric cars we'll be driving and all the clean electricity we'll need to make things like green steel. Ontario's electricity system operator says we'll have to generate at least double our current electricity capacity if we hope to reach net zero. Think of it. That means massive amounts of new clean electricity, from more wind and solar to hydrogen power and energy storage. The system operator also predicts we'll need more than double the amount of nuclear power as we're currently producing. Canadian-made can-do nuclear reactors are an energy source that safely produce no greenhouse gases. And right now, those can-do nuclear plants are already producing more than half of Ontario's electricity, all of it clean and dependable. Doubling that capacity is going to take a lot of planning. Our sponsors at the Nuclear Innovation Institute 
No, you can't just flip a switch to meet that demand. Big energy projects require environmental assessments and a host of other studies to make sure they're done right. That takes time. We need to start that planning now. And nearly 60% of Canadians agree. My polling shows that Canadians across the country support governments doing the environmental groundwork now so we have the option to add more nuclear power later. Getting ready now is an approach that makes sense and Canadians are sensible. Because at the end of the day, getting to net zero is a math problem and nuclear power is part of the answer. Just do the math. Scott, what's your final pick? I, I'm taking Levesque. I am. I did. I wasn't joking. I had Levesque uh, circled on my sheet for a long time. And I just think if you look at his influence, I mean, first of all, I just, uh, as my third pick, it's sort of, it, it's fitting as my third final pick because like for me personally, right, I'm about to turn 55, like the nostalgia, I, like I got interested in politics because of the constitutional battles between Levesque and Trudeau. That's my first earliest memory of just being captivated by this, you know, these, these, these massive, the Donald When you Britain, were 11, you fucking nerd. I know, I know. I was a complete twerp. <laughs> but I was just captivated by that. And, and it wouldn't have worked if Trudeau hadn't had such a giant against whom to contend with. It was the clash of those two. It was that Donald Britton champions documentary kind of thesis, right? And the mano a mano. But then if you look at his, if you look at his record, you know, from the time he was elected, um, he creates, you know, it, it isn't just the sort of, you know, that strain. Like he makes it a political movement. And here's, and friends of ours, David. Creates a party. I'm, Anybody that creates a party has to get a bonus mark, I would say. Creates a party. And then you think about it like, so oh, like a movie. I was only really. I, even more, yeah, you know. I was only eight. Well, he 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 harnessed a movement and turned yeah. it into uh, an but institution. But like organized it, you know, and, and, and an elected institution against a lot of fundamental forces. So the other thing I would say about Levesque, it was always I remember one time, David, a long time ago, like early nineties, and Bill Fox and I were chatting um, in our offices, and. Bill starts telling me the story about 76 and the night of the election and how that's his most striking political memory, right? Saying like, we, we're watching this unfold. The Pekis win the election. It was uh, 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 an incomprehensible political event. It, it felt like that night that Quebec had separated. That was the way that, it, you know, that, that he's telling the story to me. Like that we thought that that was more or less made an, uh, a referendum inevitable, and therefore this must indicate what the political will of, of Quebec was. And then, incidentally, like four years later, I'm sitting around with Ellie, and he tells me the same story from the perspective of someone who was covering for CBC and has exactly the same recollection, attaches the same weight, the same gravity to that moment. Um, Ken recites that story all the time about playing right hockey in, uh, during that time and being struck by what a moment was as an Anglo living in Quebec as a, an Ontarian. Yeah, it tells a great Quebec. story about the about a game in the forum the night of the election and exactly. how distracted the crowd was. I can't remember if that's just something he if that's a story he tells or if he told that in the game or it's in the game. Another book. It's, it's yeah. in the game. Um, but so like I just you know the guy was monumental and then. He sort of reconstitutes himself with political challenge when, you know, like anybody else as an incumbent, he has challenges. And it forms this alliance out of convenience and with Mulroney in the 80s and, and makes that work. Like, you know, and he didn't hang around for a long time. He left in like 85 or something. But Jesus Christ, right? Like without, without his tacit support, um, you know, he pushed the button that made the machine – uh, Quebec nationalism go to Mulroney and all those votes in Francophone Quebec. So his influence is pretty ginormous. I'll, I'll well, he took with, he described what he was doing with Mulroney as taking a beautiful risk. Hmm. Yes. I'll hmm. never forget in 2011 when I was on tour with Jack and he delivered uh, a speech at the Olympia Theater in Montreal and it was like just at the peak of the crest, right? And it was it was pandemonium. It was like people lined up around the block and you know and uh, I was on the floor 
in the crowd and an older gentleman came up to me and said in French, I've never seen something like this since René Lévesque. And I said, holy fuck. Yeah, no, you, <laughs> you, knew you, were onto, you knew you were yeah, onto something you there. you were onto watermark. something, right? right? Like, it was it was that feeling, you know? But you show so, him now, like, I showed him my oldest son, Jack, you know, I remember a few years ago showing him pictures of René Lévesque and he's like, what the fuck is this, right? You got the short <laughs> little guy with a comb over smoking a cigarette, you know, and he's like, this guy... This guy electrified people. This guy almost broke Canada up. You know, like Maybe ah, you had to be there. Television. Oh, yo, but authenticity, <laughs> authenticity to the max, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally yeah. seeing yeah. the guy. Totally mm-hmm. seeing the guy. Um, okay, so before we get to you, Corey, let's sum up. Jordan, you have th- your three members of your team are. I got Trudeau. I've got Valerie Pierre Knott, Trudeau. And I've got Tommy. Okay. Scott, you've got Maroney. Hazel McCallion, Rene Levesque. I think that is that is that is a fucking that's pretty that's good a battleship. I would say the only name chosen so far that wasn't on my list is Hazel McCallion. And then, all right, Corey, you made that third, clear. Your third pick. <laughs> well, I'm I'm constrained uh, by the rules here. I got to pick somebody from Quebec, um, and uh, the picks. I know that you I modern conservatives don't like to be constrained by rules. I know you like to yeah. just like burn all the institutions. Yeah. That wasn't how I thought you were going to end that sentence, Scott. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I could maybe dump uh, Christy Clark because I'm pretty sure Brad Wall looks good in a dress. I don't know whether that would count. I can get two picks this time. No, no, no. It doesn't work. That's... Okay, work um, harder, Corey. <laughs> all right. All right, so I'm going to be uh, backed into a corner here. I'm going to pick Lucien Bouchard, and yeah. uh, I'm going to Add say in. for a lot of a lot of the similar reasons and rationale that you that you gave uh, around Levesque. Only he's kind of the guy who picks up the baton at that point, uh, and uh, I think it's it, you know it's very difficult to ever think that there would be somebody who could match Levesque's uh, charisma, but I think Bouchard comes close. Uh, in terms of uh, what he was able to accomplish. A lot of Mulroney's success... Only for a couple of months, and he had the flesh-eating disease helping him with that. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, when you can... Out, when you what can a break! Your, what a lucky <laughs> fella! Yeah, you yeah, know, right? You know, nothing like losing a leg uh, to, to really... <laughs> yeah. Um, but look, he he took the country to the to the brink of uh, of, of separation uh, mm. and of Quebec. Like it's mm. you know, it's very difficult to imagine them doing that well absent him. You know, when you look at uh, Jacques Parizeau, I think he was more of a millstone around uh, the the efforts during the referendum than he was a benefit. And it really was on on the basis of Bouchard's charisma and uh, that uh, that they would they did as well as they did. And I think you can make an argument that he was a big part of. Uh, Mulroney's success in Quebec and in, uh, in in both of the uh, record-breaking elections uh, in the '80s. So I, I think he's you know in term if if this is just absent ideology, obviously I'm I you know not a separatist. I don't uh, uh, agree with uh, what he was trying to do. But if it's just pure political talent and and accomplishments, I, I think he's got to be on the list. On the day of the referendum in '95. Uh, I'm seeing John, a real opportunity for myself. I'm I'm feeling very good about my prospects. I mean, Lucien Bouchard. Bouchard. Lucien Bouchard never got more votes than his opponent in a election. Charay beat him in the popular vote. That's true. In the one election yeah. in which he ran as uh, as BQ leader, he had, I'm telling you guys, he had a month and a half, um, and yeah. he gets and he gets serious demerit points for fucking Mulroney the way he fucked Mulroney. Mulroney took. A fucking huge risk on him, and brought him in, and he turned around and he knifed him right in the back, and the country right in the back. Terrible. It is. It it is an astonishing Shakespearean thing what went down there, and on a human level, for two people who had been friends since they were twenty years old to do that to someone like that, it's almost. Um, it, it's it, it's it's almost impossible. That's why I've never. That's why I've never. You know, put you in a position of great power, Scott, because I just don't no. trust what you would do. <laughs> well, well, I. I think, <laughs> Thanks for the thoughtfulness. Um, but I'll just, I'll say this about Bouchard. I remember you may say it was a month and a half, but it was a fucking month and a half that mattered. It almost mattered more than anything. Um, and I remember in 95, you know, uh, John Ray ran all of Chrétien's campaigns and I worked on 93, 97 and 2000. And, um, and, uh, and of course he was very instrumental also in the referendum campaign and in the national yes campaign for, uh, for Charlottetown. 
And I remember on the day of the referendum, John Ray sitting there, not knowing what it was going to be and feeling it was tight, not recognizing it was going to be that tight, but he was clearly alarmed about where things were at. Um, he, I presume, had access to polling that he wasn't sharing with me. He was, he was alarmed. I remember him saying, he's a very quiet guy, you know, and John was like, one man, just one man, right? Like, just it, like, and this was before the vote totals were coming in, but you could tell he was just like preoccupied with, we fucking had this thing, right? We had that that you know uh, anglophile fool of a of a leader, uh, and then you know all of a sudden overnight they throw Bouchard in the middle of the play, and it fucking it all goes to threads. Just one man, and it reminds you like you know one person what a, like they can just hinge history. So he was pretty was pretty scary that night. All right, so Corey's team is Brad Wall, Christy Clark. And Lucien Bouchard. Yep. Interesting, interesting caucus meeting, I say. <laughs> um, <laughs> so not a lot, I, not a lot of Ottawa lovers on that team, I gotta say. No. Yeah, yeah, this is this is true to form, Corey. <laughs> I'm gonna throw a wild curveball at you. Excellent. Wild curveball at you. Because my team has tons of governing experience, tons of governing competence but lacks a little pizzazz and charisma, as you all have pointed out. Maybe an electoral liability to be so dull. So I'm gonna spice it up with Iona Campagnolo. And Iona Campagnolo, I say qualifies because while she wasn't a leader, she was the president of the part, Liberal Party and she was the president of the Liberal Party in a different way than most people are presidents of political parties. Iona came from BC. Iona had been a member of parliament uh, from 1974 to 1979 in the riding of Skeena, which is Prince Rupert's sawmill territory. And out of that riding came the most elegant, the most glamorous woman you've ever met and smart as a whip and a shrewd political tactician. She was a Trudeau minister, but didn't really make her mark there other than being an obviously inspired presence on the political scene. But she really made her mark when she came back and got elected as president of the Liberal Party in 1982, which was at its real nadir at the end of the Pierre Trudeau days. And we were about to suffer the 1984 defeat, which if anybody with any institutional memory, it would have been much worse had Mr. Trudeau stayed on uh, that defeat um, than it was even under Mr. Turner. And she became, in a way that no party president I've ever seen has become, almost a co-leader. She is a huge public profile and enormously popular at a time when nobody in the Liberal Party was popular. I remember advancing a tour for her of Saskatchewan. She spent seven days in the province going community to community. And Corey, there were 700 people at 8 o'clock in PA for a $20 breakfast with her. Like it was that kind of thing. She was a genuine phenomenon. And she then, the Trudeau people were trying to basically absorb the Liberal Party into the PMO and run the party out of the PMO. And she, they thought she would be their lapdog, but they found out differently. And she completely gummed up their works. Instead, she used the harness, the power of the energy that came out of the 1982 convention when a bunch of young liberals started pushing for reform and agitating against PMO control and she democratized the party, she put in new structures and she fought the PMO for the independence of the Liberal Party of Canada. And uh, years later when she co-chaired Paul's leadership campaign, everywhere she went she would still be comped, every hotel would still comp her the most beautiful suite they had in the uh, in the hotel. She is something, Iona Campanola. She still is out there in Victoria. And so I got, I've got Barassa and I've got San Laurent and I've got Iona Campanola. And I'm pretty, feeling pretty good about my team. <laughs> I, I'm going to beat your team for sure. Because you know, no you way. overrate <laughs> Pierre Trudeau, Jordan. You overrate <laughs> Pierre Trudeau. I don't know. I mean, I, I still think, uh, I think raw charisma, my team, my team leans heavy on, <laughs> on, on that. But, uh, I, I was, you know, I know Iona Campanola more from her most high-profile experience of sexism, right? With Turner, right? That's 
you know, that's yeah, but that's also who she was, right? That's that's also right. Mm -hmm. She was. I remember meeting Iona for the first time and thinking to myself, this woman. Like, I thought she was out of a Rogers Astaire movie, right? Like, she was, like, seven foot tall, mm. like, buttered to the edge, hair perfect, everything. And you're, like, but not haughty, right? Like, just just incredibly charismatic and sort of magnetic and stuff. And I do think she's kind of, she's sort of forgotten because she didn't play a role that was as public. Although she, as you say, she was She should have run public. for leader in 84. Uh, she was quite, she was... She was astonishing, and she was she mattered during that time when you know the party was trying to dig itself uh, out of the uh, the deepest ditch it had ever been in uh, until Michael Gantchev came along. Well, <laughs> there's always, there's always I, a deeper I, I, ditch. <laughs> well, I think if like if we're talking about people who have played that kind of uh, pivotal role inside parties, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up Marjorie LeBreton as uh, I think one of the one of the most impactful women in conservative politics federally. Mm -hmm. Worked for every party leader since Stephen Baker, uh, and worked well with them. And uh, uh, just in terms of longevity and uh, having played a central role in, in basically every one of those parties, uh, you know, I can't think of anyone else that holds a candle to Marjorie in terms of of uh, that sort of influence in in uh, the cons in conservative politics at the national level. Maybe the best example, though, actually, is your pick. Uh, Corey, like you look at Christy Clark. I can remember we were working together at, at, at uh, LPC, Liberal Party of Canada National Headquarters in 92 or so. And then she left uh, to go back out to BC. And she just bombed around the province going end to end, height to bottom. And she built the BC Liberal Party with Gordon Wilson. And she was responsible for the recruitment of all those candidates. She just muscled that party into existence. And then, of course, eventually, you know, she becomes deputy premier and then premier and all like like that thing did not exist except for her like pure spade work. OK, if we get a secret bonus pick along these lines, then <laughs> I got to I got to add Rosemary Brown to the list. So she's somebody who just has a, an incredible record. She was elected first first black woman elected to provincial legislature over 10 years in that office and first black woman to run for party leadership. And people forget, but she came a strong second to, and she got over 40% of the vote. And this is in the seventies, like just a huge barrier breaker and uh, an incredible career. And she of course actually went on to serve Canada in other ways too. She was on the security intelligence review committee and like quite active right up into her later years and just left a huge mark. So I would like to have her on my team also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let, let's right. do a little examination of these teams yes. that we're left with here. So, Jordan, let me tell you why you overestimate Pierre Trudeau. I'd love to hear it. Right? Because you talk about charisma. That charisma only existed one time. That charisma only existed in 1968. The only truly impressive Pierre Trudeau campaign is 1968, where he genuinely swept the country on the force of his own personality. Mm -hmm. And, there, you know, it's one of the most legendary elections in Canadian history. Yeah, I'm not taking reason. anything yeah. away, but we still talk about Trudeau mania, right? But, you know, in, in three elections following that, 72, um, no, just the two, I guess, 72 and 79, right? You know how many seats he won outside of Quebec? Around 40. Around 40. Just think of how fucking bad a result that is. It's pretty bad. Right? For the Liberal Party to win 40 seats in all of English Canada. The, well, two, election, the two elections that he won after 68, not I mean, in 72 he won, yeah. but whatever. The two elections he won after 68, one was handed... 74 is an impressive, grinded-out win where your mm -hmm. opponent puts a stupid policy idea forward and you make the campaign about them yeah, and you grind work. them into the dirt. That was work. That wasn't Pierre Trudeau. That was just work. And then 1980, they hid him. Like, he promised to quit if elected. This is how it started. He said, if you, I'm only really the leader through this election campaign, and if you elect me, I will quit. And the campaign, Keith Davey kept him so hidden from the public and from the media that it would make Corey proud. And um, <laughs> so, I mean, that was a win in spite of Pierre Trudeau. 
Okay. I think you defeat yourself for that argument, David. Yeah, I think I, mean, I think it's a mark of genuine greatness and 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 legacy <laughs> that Pierre Trudeau was able to win elections in so many different ways. And <laughs> so many, so many different <laughs> you think despite that's a joke? Himself, I mean it. Despite, despite himself, despite at the himself, end, right? Like literally, like yeah. and. And how many people are able to sort of be that opportunistic, right? Yeah. He pulls on wage and, and price controls. Then he, you know, then uh, 1980, like the guy was dead and buried. And I gotta and he, be clear, really like, crawled it's, his it's way out of the Quebec. Quebec. Fan. It's all just, Quebec. It's I all Quebec. I think you can get around it's, him it's, because of his his versatility. Like that's what I come back to. But I also have to say, there's poetry in my choices, right? Because why? you have to you have to imagine it, like. What's the caucus meeting going to be like, you know, around the War Measures Act, right? With with my crew, we got Tommy, we got Trudeau. It's you know, it's going to be spicy, right? Um, Hang on. But I think I think there's you know I, I think that Trudeau's real strength there is is his, yeah sheer staying power and versatility, not the ability to quit when it's time. Others have done that better. Valerie Plant, let's face it. Okay, I'm telling She's you. Contemporary. I'm telling you, he lost. Right. Hold up. Bold I'm telling you, Trudeau. Trudeau Go? was all Come on. Trudeau was all Quebec. We'll he lost English Canada we'll every election except except. We'll see, but, uh, but I, I, uh, you know, find find me so, like you got somebody who who came, uh, you know, sort of out of nowhere, won a resounding victory, and repeated it with a bigger margin. That is an accomplishment. That shows chops. My right. team kills. My team kills. I got like yeah. every single level of government: Mulroney federally, Levesque provincially, yeah, I was gonna say, Hazel in some cases, locally. Your team kills literally. I just, yeah, exactly. And you got that. You want to talk about versatility and and durability? They can murder people and get away with it. Not even, <laughs> not even lose elections or have trouble. I think um, you're the Leafs. I think your team is the Leafs. I think your team oh is the Leafs. God. You you have the a Leafs. great star. You have a great star at the top of the roster, and then you have no depth. You got a guy who's going to leave your party to start his own party in Rennie Levesque, and you got Hazel. Leave his own party. Fuck, he built an entire government that lasted for He left the Liberal Party. He was a Liberal cabinet minister. You're bringing a guy I in know. who's going to walk out on you and start his own party. Listen, he was, you know, he, he bails on Jean Lesage and people go, well, that's the end of his career. And then he builds a beast in his basement that eats the country. Like, I mean, that's pretty fucking accomplished. Yeah, I just look, good. these guys win. These guys are winners and they left a legacy that shaped the country. Um, I don't know. You just like you can't even land a punch on this team. Uh, I think Dave is just jealous because his team's snoozy. Super I am so not jealous of Scott's team. I am somewhat jealous of your team because I love Pierre Trudeau, despite what I'm saying about him. <laughs> I, I, I kind of have a soft spot for your team. Corey's got Christy Clark. He's got Brad Wall, and he's got Lucien Bouchard. Lucien yeah. Bouchard. Who's going to lead that party? Yeah, I just. Oh I man, want, I want to that, see that, that, that would, meeting. That, that would be tough, eh? Um, <laughs> no, that, that would be tough. Uh, I think that yeah. Bouchard would go to Wall and say, "You, you lead," and then he'd fuck him. <laughs> yeah, and then Christy probably. Would yeah, <laughs> and then, that's yeah, right. Probably, probably. Yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of A types in that uh, in that caucus meeting. Yeah, I think. But what what do they have in common? I think they're all political entrepreneurs and. Um, uh, and I've got a soft spot for that. I like I like provincial politicians. You know, and, uh, we're sort of uh, constrained by the uh, by the format here. But uh, you know, if if I could add other people, it, you know, it would have been you know Mike Harris or Doug Ford. Uh, but for similar reasons, like I, I like folks that uh, that uh, uh, build something new, that uh, that put something together that is uh, you know unconventional, redefines political coalition. Uh, I've got a soft spot for. Sort of Western populism and uh, uh, and uh, and its Ontario equivalents, although they're as we discussed a little bit different in complexion. But mm. that's always that's always where my heart goes. So I'm I'm pretty happy with my my picks. All right. Well, we will have to subject them to a vote of the people. Okay. We got we got we'll to post see. these teams and ask people to vote on them so that I can win. Right. Because I think well, I want that to hear what other I want to hear what other people would pick too. Like I I feel like. Uh, I'd like to see other people's teams. Yeah. Well, fire it up. Come at us, people. All right. That is our show for this week. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS. I want to thank 
CN Rail, and the Nuclear Innovation Institute for their sponsorship and help with this podcast. I want to thank all of you who watched and listened. I want to thank my team here, my friends, as always, for their good cheer today. We'll be back next week talking about the issues, if there are any. Um, and in the meantime, <laughs> take care of yourselves and st stay tuned for more Curse of Politics. Bye.